Uh, it's my honor this morning to present our chapel speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Fairchild. He received his doctorate in New Testament studies from Drew University. Dr. Fairchild is, a, is an intelligent man. He's a traveler. He is a researcher. As a matter of fact, he has received twice research grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, he has recently discovered two previously unknown ancient synagogues in the country of Turkey, including the world's oldest known synagogue. And he had information on this research published in the Biblical Archaeology Review in 2012 and in the Journal of Ancient Judaism in 2014. Uh, he currently teaches in our Bible and Religions Department here on campus, and he's currently the program director for the Ephes Ephesus Meeting, which is an academic conference at the ancient site of Ephesus in Turkey. He annually travels to Turkey, Greece, Israel, and Egypt, and Jordan, and I'm supposed to go with you sometime soon, right? You hold me to that promise to conduct his study and his tours. Can you put your hands together for the New Testament version of Indiana Jones, Dr. Mark Fairchild. What a treasure we have with Arthur, love that guy. Just trying to get him to uh, travel with me is not easy. Uh, this morning we want to talk about suffering in the Christian life. In a couple of my classes this week, we've been talking about what it means to be a disciple of our Lord and Savior. And here in America, I'm convinced that we really don't understand what it means to be a disciple. We're not really encumbered with some of the difficulties that uh, Christians elsewhere in this world have to deal with. As Arthur has mentioned, I frequently travel to the Middle East, and there I see churches and Christians that, in my mind, are closer and more similar to the earliest Christian church than what we experience here in America. In the Middle East, Christianity is a minority. Christians there face pressures and troubles that we don't experience here in America. Well, before I go further, this is a uh, copy of the Gospels uh, in uh, Coptic, which is an Egyptian language, and you also see Arabic on the margins. Uh, the picture here that you see is a, uh, an underground church. When I travel to Turkey, uh, there are dozens of underground cities. More than 30 of them have been discovered. Why do people build cities? Not just homes, but cities underground. Some of these cities are more than eight stories deep and could house as many as 8,000 people. I've been to dozens of these throughout Turkey, and this is one of the pictures that I've shot there in Turkey. See, the early Christians realized that this world is not our paradise. When we turned our back on God, way back in the book of Genesis, we were cast out of the Garden of Eden. We were thrown into the world of darkness and evil. Peter wrote two letters to Christians that were living in this region. This region is actually in present-day uh, northern Turkey. These Christians were being bitterly persecuted for their faith. Peter began his first letter addressing the Christians as aliens who were scattered throughout Pontus, Cappadocia, Galatia, Asia, and Bithynia. They weren't aliens. They lived there all their lives. But why did he use that term, aliens? It's because he's reminding us of the fact that this is not our home and we're in alien territory. Our song, I didn't choose our song, but what did it say? The enemy reminds us that the enemy cannot separate us from the love of Christ. We live in a world where the enemy, where Satan is indeed trying to separate us from the love of Christ. In 1 Peter, in all five chapters, Peter referred to the persecutions and the sufferings of the Christians in those regions and he offered advice regarding how they might deal with these unjust attacks. In the three centuries after Christ, the persecution continues 
and many of the Christians fled underground. So as you see on the screen in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says, you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. Think about that. You have been called for this purpose. We don't think about that often, do we? We don't think that this is what we're heading towards. Christ has given us an example. Later, 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says, Since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Again, he makes reference to this being our purpose. This is our expectation. We're living in hostile, alien territory. We need to be aware. Of course, what uh, Peter is talking about is what Jesus had previously mentioned when he gathered his disciples together. Just prior to Jesus departing and heading to Jerusalem where Jesus knew full well that he was going to be crucified, Jesus told his disciples that you need to carry your cross as well. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is not a description of a, of a life that's carefree and trouble-free. As Christians, we're going to experience trouble, persecutions, and suffering. Anticipate it and prepare for it. Jesus, of course, was three years on this earth, and he did a lot of things, and he uh, spoke a lot of parables and had a lot of teachings, and our Gospels collect a lot of that information. But there's an interesting passage in a book that was never included in Scripture, and that's called the Epistle of Barnabas. And Barnabas preserves a teaching of Jesus that we can find in no other Gospel. And that's a teaching where Jesus makes this statement. Those who wish to see me and take possession of my kingdom, remember Jesus was preaching the coming kingdom of God and how urgent and necessary it is for us to enter into that kingdom. So those who wish to see me and to take possession of my kingdom must possess me through affliction and suffering. Life in this world is a test. This is what the scriptures tell us. To see the substance of our faith. Satan controls much of this world. The book of Revelation tells us he's been cast out of heaven. He's been defeated in the heavenly realm. And he's thrown down here to the earth to torment us as Christians and to wreak havoc against God's purposes here on earth. He's the author of trouble and suffering in this world. Many people believe that life should be free of trouble. Many people, including Christians, believe that suffering is an aberration. There's something wrong. But these scriptures tell us something different. Some Christians question, question God, when we experience hardships and sufferings in our lives. But the early Christians looked upon suffering it's an opportunity to, to demonstrate their trust in God. Trust in God in spite of the circumstances that we face. Writing to the Colossians, Paul, not just Peter, but Paul also describes suffering as a way of participating in the life of Christ. Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. It's an interesting expression. I rejoice in my sufferings. It's hard to rejoice when you're being beaten down, when life is dealing you Something like that. In my flesh, I do my share, as Paul says. I do my share in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's afflictions. 
We don't think of something lacking in Christ's afflictions. But what he's talking about is participation. Salvation is participation. Christ has done his part. He died upon the cross, and he opened up that door of salvation. It is our responsibility to walk through that door, though the journey may be fraught with suffering and with difficulties. This is a uh, picture from down deep inside of one of those underground churches in Turkey. The Christians built churches there. In addition to homes and dwellings, they worshiped in these sites. And so you can see beautiful frescoes on the ceilings. This is a depiction of Christ, the Pantocrator. Christ, ruler of all. Pantocrator means ruler of all. Jesus is in control. Even though this world may be careening out of control, and our life may be a life of suffering, God is in control. And the early Christians knew that. Forty years after Peter, 40 years, yes, 40 years after Peter wrote First and Second Peter to the Christians in this region of Turkey, Cappadocia and Bithynia, the Roman Emperor Trajan appointed Pliny the Younger to govern the region. Pliny continued the policy of persecuting and killing Christians. Pliny wrote several letters. We're fortunate that uh, Pliny's letters have been preserved, and one of these letters talks about Pliny's persecution of the Christians. And this is what he says. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. He continues, those who denied that they were or had been Christians, and moreover, those who cursed Christ, none of which any of those who are really Christians, it is said, can be forced to do, these I thought should be discharged. They all worshiped your image and the statues of the gods and cursed Christ. See, what happens is when these people's lives were on the line, some of them apostatized, they capitulated, they gave up their faith. They cursed Christ. Can you imagine this? Others maintained faith and were killed. And still others went underground. One of the uh, Christians that I most respect is a fellow by the name of Origen. Origen lived during the late second century and into the third century, lived in Egypt. Origen's father was taken away and martyred during the persecutions under the Roman Emperor Septimius Severus. And as a boy, that happened in Origen's youth, Origen himself would have followed his father to his death, but his mother hid his clothes and wouldn't allow him to depart from the house. Otherwise, Origen's life would have been cut short. Later, Origen himself was tortured for his faith by the Roman Emperor Decius, and he died from his wounds a few years later. Among his extensive writings, there's an essay that Origen wrote that was entitled Exhortation to Martyrdom. And this is what he says. Let it be seen whether we have taken up our own crosses and followed Jesus. This happens if Christ lives in us. If we wish to save our soul in order to get it back better than a soul, let us lose it by martyrdom. The early Christians knew the cost of discipleship. And it doesn't always mean martyrdom but we miss, must be willing to do so if necessary. About 15 years ago, I uh, spent time in Turkey. Most of you know I spend a lot of time in Turkey. I'm there every year. But uh, during this particular period of time, the church that I was attending in uh, Izmir, Izmir is ancient Smyrna, mentioned in the book of Revelation. One of the members of that church um, 
was slaughtered by Islamic jihadists. His name was Najati Aydin. Najati had gone to eastern Turkey to distribute Christian literature, and he was butchered by Islamists who pretended to be interested in Christianity. Turkey's a safe country, so this doesn't happen very often. Even though it's 99% Muslim, most of the Turkish people are very secular Muslims. They don't go to the mosque, they don't read the Quran, they don't practice the Islamic faith. But the persecution of, the persecution of Christians does take place when there are confrontations and in some instances in Turkey, and more commonly throughout the Islamic world. The uh, picture that I took, this is the picture, I took several pictures actually. Um, I was surprised when I went to the funeral. The place was absolutely packed. I didn't realize there were so many Christians in Izmir. Well, in fact, there aren't that many uh, Christians in Izmir, but many of the non-Christian citizens came out to show their support for Najati Aydin. What you'll also see, if you look carefully at the uh, photograph, you'll see that there's a lot of media. I couldn't believe the media coverage. And this is Turkey making a statement. Unfortunately, many of the Islamic preachers throughout the Middle East blame Christians for their country's problems. They portray Christians as greedy, impure, and immoral. This, of course, leads to the marginalization of Christians throughout the Islamic world. In some of these countries, well, in all of these countries, of course, Christians are disappearing from the Middle East. In some of these countries, Christian population has been reduced to one-third of what existed 20 years ago. Realize that the Middle East was the birthplace of Christianity, was the center of Christianity. The greatest theologians came from the Middle East up until the Islamic invasions during the 8th century. Today, Christians in the Middle East are the outcasts of Middle Eastern society. This is what Paul says when writing to the Corinthians. He says, when we are slandered, and of course many Christians are being slandered in the Islamic world, when we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the rubbish of the world, the outcasts of all. A few months ago in January, I spent some time in Egypt. While there, I uh, visited with the so-called garbage people of Cairo. Cairo is Egypt's largest city, it's a capital. Living amidst massive amounts of garbage, there's a large hill in Cairo that is populated by Christians who are called the garbage people. These people live in appalling conditions where Cairo dumps its garbage and refuse. The filth in the putrid expanse of the hill is astonishing. The residents are scorned by most of Cairo and poverty is evident in the mud, the slime and the trash that continues to pile up. 98% of the people on the hill are Christians. And the hill has an estimated population of 100,000 people. So it's packed amidst the garbage. Most of the homes and the buildings have crosses on them. These people are not afraid to identify themselves as Christians, though they know that they're being mistreated. While the city continues to dump garbage on the place, the residents are making the most of it. They are bagging some of the garbage and are recycling it. It's one of the ways that these people are surviving in the midst of conditions that are unbelievable. Remarkably, 
the largest church in the Middle East resides at the top of the hill. Over the years, an underground church, a cave church, was constructed and has been expanded to now a 15,000 seat arena for Christian worship. If you go to the top of the hill, this is the nicest and the cleanest part in the entire hill. Christians who are coping with adverse circumstances, with persecution, harassment, Christians who are suffering, yet they're dealing with it in the best way they can. When Paul claimed that we are the rubbish of the world, the outcasts of all, I cannot think of a better example than the garbage people right here in Cairo. At the beginning of his letter, Peter referred to the Christians as aliens in a foreign land. If we faithfully serve Christ, we cannot expect to be well received in this world. Peter states that what we have been called states that we have been called for this very purpose. Remember the first two verses that I had read. We have been called for this purpose, to be light in a world of darkness. You live in a land where it's relatively easy to be a Christian. Christianity, I wouldn't say is popular in America, but at least nobody's going to attack you for your faith. But think about Christians who are living in these lands in the Middle East. This is a photograph of that cave church. And like I say, over the years, the cave church has been expanded, it has been enlarged. You can now see seating. This arena seats 15,000 people. Peter explains that these persecutions and distresses are a test of our faith. You see, God has given us some 80 years here on earth. This is not paradise. This is not the Garden of Eden. God is watching us, trying to determine how it is that we handle distressing circumstances. And not all of us are going to be persecuted to the extent that these Christians in the Middle East are persecuted. Not all of us are going to be faced with what the Christians under Pliny the Younger, the Christians who are martyred for the first three years. But you will suffer and there will be tests of your faith. Our trials and tests won't always cost us our lives, but you will be put on trial. Peter, again, chapter one, verses six and seven, makes this statement. You have been distressed by various trials so that the testing of your faith may be proved. Suffering is an opportunity. It's not an anomaly. It's something that we should it's, rejoice in the opportunity that we have to prove our faith and our trust in God. You see, the sufferings and the persecutions drove the early Christians, we're talking about during the first three centuries, drove the early Christians underground. The sufferings of the Christians in Cairo likewise drove them underground as well. But their faith remained strong and they emerged from these cave churches to testify to life in Christ. The garbage people in Cairo have been rejected and scorned by the residents of Cairo. They become the refuse, the garbage of the city. Yet they have established the largest church, not just in Cairo and not just in Egypt. They have established the largest church in the Middle East. My question to you is, when your faith is tested, how will you respond? Some might flee, like many Christians have fled the Middle East. The population, the Christian population in the Middle East has been reduced significantly, especially over the last 20 years. Others may give up the faith. This is what happened with the Islamic invasions in the 8th century, 9th century, and the centuries thereafter. Many of the people of Turkey do not realize that their ancestors, they don't even know that their ancestors were Christians before they were forced to embrace Islam. 
So some may capitulate and give up the faith. Still others died, remained firm in the faith, and suffered martyrdom. And still yet others have gone underground, only to reemerge and to testify of life in Christ. That's what uh, we see in the Middle East. Now, as I've uh, encouraged Arthur to come and join us on uh, trips to Turkey, the Middle East, and I'm sure someday he's going to fulfill that promise, I'd invite the rest of you as well. I will be conducting a, uh, a January term trip to uh, Israel, and then we'll spend another week in Egypt as well. And at that time, we will visit the garbage people. So if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and to, to do ministry uh, in Egypt to, uh, and, and to experience what it is firsthand, to talk with some of the people who are living in these conditions, come and join us. Let's close in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we uh, thank you for life as it is and the freedom that we here in America enjoy. But Lord, sometimes I feel like we've lost something because it's so easy to believe in you and to function as Christians here in America. Open our hearts, Lord. Open our minds that we might uh, realize what is the cost of discipleship. When Jesus tells us to take up our cross and to follow after him, when Paul talks about participating and doing our part in filling up the suffering of Christ, Lord, move in our hearts and our minds and use us as instruments to share your gospel in the world in which we exist. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.